Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Selamat siang dan selamat datang kembali Bapak Ibu di ruang virtual dalam acara Building a State of Art Internal Quality Assurance to Foster and Integrate Graduate Employability. Kembali kami mengingatkan Bapak Ibu untuk merinim nama menjadi instansi atau perguruan tinggi underscore nama dan mengisi daftar hadir melalui tautan yang ada pada kolom chat. Pastikan bahwa email Bapak Ibu aktif agar panitia dapat mengirimkan e-sertifikat kepada email Bapak Ibu. Selain itu, seluruh materi yang disampaikan oleh narasumber baik dari sesi pertama atau sesi kedua nantinya akan dikirimkan oleh panitia melalui fitur kolom chat. Dan webinar ini akan dapat disaksikan ulang melalui YouTube channel UITV. Pada sesi kedua acara hari ini, karena kedua narasumber berasal dari luar negeri, mulai saat ini saya akan memandu Bapak Ibu hadirin menggunakan bahasa Inggris. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Building a State of Art Internal Quality Assurance to Foster and Integrate Graduate Employability. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Isha Ramadian, the Public Relations Ambassador of Universitas Indonesia, and I will be the master of ceremony of this event. Distinguished guests, this event is divided into two sessions. In the first session, we already discussed employability and quality assurance of higher education institutions in Indonesia. And in the second session, we will discuss employability and quality assurance of higher education institutions with distinguished speakers from United Kingdom and Austria. Therefore, I would like to introduce you to the speakers and the topics. The first presentation, which is foreseeing the future trend, challenges and stakeholders' expectations on higher education institutions' development will be delivered by the Higher Education Consultant, Quality Assurance and International, Dr. Fiona Crozier, and the second present and the second presentation, which is shifting paradigm of quality assurance in higher education institutions into employability, policy, and practices in various countries, will be delivered by the Dean for Accreditation and Quality Management and the Director of the Department for Program Management and Teaching and Learning Support, Vienna University of Economics and Business, Dr. Oliver Fettori. The second session will be moderated by the coordinator for International Accreditation, Quality Assurance Unit, Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Indonesia. To Dr. Dewi Ratnashari, the time is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I will uh, start the session, the second session, and I will read uh, Miss Fiona Crozier, good afternoon from, or good, maybe good morning, Miss Fiona. Uh, yes. Good morning. Fiona has worked in higher education for 30 years. Her experience in quality assurance pass from spans from funding council, university, and quality assurance agency. She works nationally and also internationally in the field. She was vice president of the board of the European Association for Quality Assurance from 2009 until 2013. And her most recent post was head of an international uh, QAA in UK, Quality Assurance of Agency for Higher Education. And she's now an independent consultant. She also involved in evaluation of process and standard during the COVID-19 crisis in Georgia, as well as Indonesia providing training on internal and external quality assurance to Indonesian University on behalf of HEEA City from Taiwan. She also has involvement in the EU Asian Share project and strong interest in the, in the articulation in the development of implementation of regional frameworks for quality assurance such as in the ACAF and in ASEAN. She is in committee and board member for ACPUA a board of quality and strategic foresight in Spain and an ACU, AQ, and also University Quality Students in Catalonia. We welcome Ms. Fiona Crozier, please. 
Thank you very much. Thank you for the for the welcome. The first thing I must say is to apologize. I, I can't seem to use the virtual background. When I do, I disappear and all you can see are my glasses. So I, I don't think this is so good for you. So I, I no, apologize for that. No problem. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, good morning. It's a real pleasure for me to be here with you. Uh, well, my pleasure would be greater if I were in you, in Indonesia with you. Um, I miss it very much at the moment, so I'm sorry I can't be there. Uh, but it's a pleasure to join you this morning. Um, my presentation is probably more of a gentle introduction to the topic that Oliver and I are going to discuss this morning. Um, I'm going to introduce some of the big themes uh, and then around internal quality assurance in particular, in general. And then Oliver's going to pick up some of the points in more detail. So I'm just going to start to share my screen so that I can. Where am I? Good. Bear with me just one minute. Uh, I was trying to open the virtual background, so I no longer have my uh, desktop open. Where has it gone? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble accessing my presentation. Uh, you want me to share your screen? You can just say oh, uh, next. Oh, it, it's okay. Hi. Mm, no, that's not it. Sorry, I'm uh, Yeah, I think rather than waste time, that might be easier. Uh, I, I've saved it onto my desktop, but I can't seem to get back to my desktop at the moment. Okay, wait, I open your presentation. Thank you. I'll stop screen sharing. Okay. Share screen. Is this the one, uh, Ms. Fiona? Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Going to slideshow. Okay, I think we can. <laughs> apologies for that. I think we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. So, as I said, I, I'm going to look at some overarching themes. Um, you know, foreseeing future trends and challenges, it's quite difficult because, um, well, firstly, uh, we say in English, I don't have a crystal ball into which I can look to foresee the future. Uh, but also things change so fast that sometimes we're so busy looking at one change that another one has actually happened. So basically what I want to say during the course of my presentation is that we need something stable that works for us, regardless of the trends, the changes, the challenges, something that responds to our expectations of our stakeholders and that allows us to have a good basis. Uh, regardless of what might be thrown at us from the outside in terms of changing trends and so on. So what I'm going to look at, look at very quickly are some of the external quality assurance processes and frameworks um, at international and regional levels and how that impacts on the quality assurance agencies that we work with and on higher education institutions. To have a quick look at the change in the higher education environment um, and that's going to come out throughout. The, oh, sorry, go back, please. That's going to come out throughout the presentation. I also really want to look at the heart of it is where does this balance lie between what happens to us through external quality assurance and where we have some some of our own responsibility, where we can take responsibility for our own our own quality assurance internally and where that balance lies. Uh, I want to look quickly at the impact of external quality assurance on internal quality assurance. Externality in internal quality assurance, I'm going to leave that to Oliver, but just to let you know that it's important. Um, and then moving from, or shifting that balance from external quality assurance to internal quality assurance. And my key message, I think, is to keep it simple. Uh, so those are the kind of areas that I'm going to cover. Uh, next, next slide, please. 
So the first thing to say, I suppose, is that trends are not dependent on higher education institutions. They can be, of course, in certain areas, but they come at us from lots of different angles. Um, they're not even national sometimes. They don't even just come from our quality assurance agencies. So I know that you're familiar with BAMPT, for example, and LAMPTKS. They're two of the agencies that I know that you've um, undertaken accreditations. Those agencies themselves are working nationally and they have the impact of national ministerial uh, desires and focus, but they're also working regionally and internationally. And the increase, I think, in regional frameworks, such as the ASEAN Quality Assurance Framework, the ACAF, for example, for us in Europe, that's the European Standards and Guidelines. I think these have a huge impact on our national agencies and on how they work. And this in turn impacts on the expectations around quality assurance in the higher education institutions themselves. Um, those agencies are in a position of looking at what's going on internationally, being involved in the development of regional processes, frameworks, standards, criteria, uh, and also, as I said, responding to the requirements of the National Ministry for Education or whatever that body might be. Sometimes those trends don't sit very comfortably together. Sometimes there can be an uncomfortable mix. Sometimes it can be there can be a real opportunity, international, regional, uh, input gives us a new perspective and so on. But sometimes there's a bit of a mix between local and national requirements and the desire to align with international expectations. And sometimes that puts all of us, including the agencies and the institutions under some pressure. Um, next slide, please. So as I said there, quality assurance is, is quite a big business. It's a global business. Uh, it's There are quality assurance agencies in pretty much, I'd say, almost every country in the world. We are not sitting in a little bubble. Uh, there are quality assurance officers or quality assurance offices or heads of quality assurance in the UK, pro-vice chancellors for quality assurance, vice rectors for quality assurance. It's a, it's a big business. Uh, and it is one of those businesses that has been reasonably stable for quite a long time. Um, but change is coming and things are starting to move and shift as we recognize that the world around us has changed significantly. The pandemic was, I think, merely a, a, a very sharp example of some of the changes. Changes had already begun before we had to respond to the pandemic. Um, but if we have a look at, and I'm not going to talk about trends and challenges and things in particular, but there is a trend in external quality assurance to look at outcomes rather than process. So what universities and institutions are actually sending out into the world rather than the processes that they use to assure their quality assurance. I think Oliver will pick this up in more detail. But this idea that student skills and employability of increasing importance, this is a global trend. This is important internationally. It's not just in, in Indonesia or in ASEAN, it's the same in Europe. But also, I think more, well, not more importantly, but as importantly, the trends in how to measure quality assurance and how to, how to operate external quality assurance processes and frameworks are also changing. The standards and the criteria need to change to respond to new trends. So if before we had a set of criteria that didn't look at student employability at all, that needs to change. But also, I think there are different instruments now coming into play for evaluation. Some of these include things like data-based or risk-based processes. Um, certainly in the UK, there's been a huge increase in using data to ascertain the quality of an institution uh, and also risk-based processes. And my little picture there is the risk-based processes. You can have lots of institutions all moving in the right direction and they are deemed to be less of less risk than the one in red, which is standing out for whatever reason is heading in the wrong direction. A risk-based process is meant to reduce bureaucracy and merely single out those areas that need scrutiny rather than to universally evaluate everyone all the time. Whether or not that works, what the benefits and advantages or disadvantages are of that are not the topic of this presentation, 
but it's certainly something that we're seeing across the world. This shift away from the cyclical evaluation using the same criteria to something that is more focused on data and something that might be risk-based. But they are merely two examples that I want to use, excuse me, to use in the presentation. Next slide, please. I'm wondering though, as I was writing this presentation, if one of the biggest trends, and it may not be a trend, maybe it's a trend in my own head or a trend that I would like to see, is a shift from external quality assurance to internal quality assurance. Because if we get our internal processes right, the logical conclusion for me would be that we get to a point where we no longer need external quality assurance. Now that, that that's probably um, rather hopeful on my part. And also uh, it, would be, it would mean that I would have had no career because although I've worked as director of quality in a university, the vast majority of my career has been at an external quality assurance agency. So I'm not going to say that they're completely unnecessary. But you take my point that if we're getting it right internally, we really should be needing less and less direct input from external quality assurance. We should be doing the internal stuff for the right reasons. Uh, next slide, please. And I particularly like this slide. Uh, I like this picture because it seems to me that up until this point, the big stones in this little balance of, of we call this a cairn in English, it's a, it's, it's a cairn and you see them on mountains and quite often when people climb mountains, if I climb a mountain, you'll see a cairn at the top and people add stones, they add little little stones onto the top of the big structure that's already there. And that's a perfect example for me. The big stones are external quality assurance. They kind of tell us in institutions what's expected of us, what we need to do, what we need to address, what we need to provide evidence about. And what we do with our internal quality assurance is that we use the little stones to kind of plug what we need. Uh, we plug it in and we, we hope that we've responded to the requirement of that big stone. So the little stones are internal quality assurance. And when external quality assurance changes slightly or when it requires something different, we get another little stone and we think, have we got a gap? Do we respond to that requirement when they come to accredit our program? Can we reply to that? Oh, no, we can't. So we need another little process and we'll put another little stone in there, another little plug for the gap. And my suggestion is that maybe what we should be doing is turning that round so that actually the big stones, the really key fundamental pillars of any process are the internal ones. And it is that external quality assurance is the one that's coming along and saying, okay, um, how are things going? Where's the gap? How are you responding to this? But that actually our bedrock, the thing that's holding our structures up is the internal quality assurance. Next slide, please. So let's just have a look at the impact of external quality assurance on internal quality assurance. Um, I don't want to dismiss external quality assurance entirely. I have no intention of doing so. In many cases, external quality assurance has been the driving force behind the development of a quality culture and an IQA system in institutions. External quality assurance can also be a really good conduit for introducing all of us to international standards and criteria, uh, international trends, international benefits, and that opens us up to a huge amount of, of benefit in terms of being able to work internationally with partners across different countries in the world if we have a shared understanding of, of external quality assurance and what's expected of us. That can be really beneficial to the internationalization of institutions. Uh, and, and last but not least, I mean, I think it, we do need to have some kind of internal, sort of independent externality that provides us with the means to reassure the public and give them confidence that we're providing a valuable education and that our students are worthy of employment. Next slide, please. However, and I say this as someone who has worked in external quality assurance for more than 25 years, it can be bureaucratic and it can be burdensome. And it can also be a blunt tool. When, when we're accredited and or when our institutions are evaluated, whatever the system is in our national context, it's only ever a snapshot in time. Quite often a peer review team come along and they're see, and I, I know this myself when I go to do uh, reviews of agencies, quality assurance agencies, 
You're seeing that agency at a particular moment in time. And the amount of time that a peer review panel has is never long enough. So we only ever get a little snapshot of, of the entirety of what's happening at an institution or even within a program. So, so external quality assurance can be a blunt, a blunt tool. And I think for institutions, uh, certainly as a director of quality at a university in Ireland, you know, my colleagues, it, it can reduce us to consumers of quality assurance rather than making us really think about why we're doing the things we do. We respond to the external process as we say, what do we have to do to get through this accreditation successfully? And then when it's over, we all go, Phew! and we think, great, that's it for another five years or six years or whatever. So it, it, it reduces us to consumers of something, I think, in some respects. Next slide, please. So what about this shifting, this shifting of balance from EQA to IQA? And I'd remind you at this point that my, my key point is that we are in a world that changes extremely quickly. And that applies to external and internal quality assurance as well. So if we shift this balance from EQA to IQA, what, what's it for? Why, why do we want to do that? As I've said, external quality assurance, I think, will always be necessary. We always need that external independent check on what we're doing. And external quality assurance agencies can provide us with a huge host of benefits in terms of introducing us to internationalization, international trends, harmonization, and so on. But I think as EQA shifts to an outcomes rather than an input focus, and as it responds to all the other trends and challenges that are out there in the world, I think that means that our internal processes become even more important because institutions do not, universities do not exist to follow out quality assurance processes. They exist because they're offering an education to students, a higher education to students. They're researching, they're providing civic functions and so on. You know, they don't spend all day every day responding to quality assurance processes. So those internal processes become even more important. The challenge I think for us is to make that shift from just responding as consumers to EQA to making IQI IQA are bedrock. And internally, I think that that means we need to be asking the right questions about what we're doing so that we can respond effectively to the EQA processes so that we can make more and more use of our stakeholders and their opinions, because that's key. If we're going to respond to the outside world and its needs and its challenges and its trends, we need to have processes that allow us to gain the opinion of our stakeholders, whoever they are, and so that we can answer the question, what happens in between the EQA visits? Next slide, please. The next slide should exemplify that very nicely. Yeah. So Henry Ford, who founded the, motor, the Ford Motor Company in 1860, he was, well, he was alive from 1863 to 1947, a long time ago. He actually said, quality means doing it right when no one else is looking. So those four or five years in between the site visits, from BAMPT or LAMPTKES or any of your other agencies. What are we doing when they're not there? And I think that that was a really nice quotation. And you know that the United Kingdom's Quality Assurance Agency where I worked is in a city called Gloucester. And there's a coffee shop in Gloucester that actually has this quotation painted on its wall, uh, which is a really, really nice, when you work at the Quality Assurance Agency and you go for a coffee at lunchtime, that's quite a thing to see on the wall while you're drinking your coffee. Next slide, please. So currently, internal quality assurance systems and instruments, let's have a look at those in a little bit more detail. Well, quite often, they involve a plan, do, check, act uh, cycle, which is very effective, and it's used in multiple different ways. Uh, internal processes will often seek to produce the evidence that we need in order to respond to our next EQA accreditation or our evaluation visit. Unfortunately, certainly this is my experience. Um, I'm hoping it's Oliver's experience as well. Um, maybe it's your experience, but quite often academic staff will find quality assurance processes, systems, requirements. They find them bureaucratic and time consuming. In other words, they fail quite often to see the value of internal quality assurance. And certainly this was my experience. 
And I would suggest that if that's the case, then it means that we're doing something wrong. Someone like me was doing something wrong and needed to change something. Because if these processes are of no value, or if, if, if our academic staff can't see the value of an internal quality assurance process, it's not worth doing it. It's a waste of time. There has to be value in what we do. People have to be able to see why it's useful. Uh, we, we need to be able to, and I think the reason for that is that if people can't see how what they're doing is used, then they won't value it. Okay, next slide, please. So IQA, I'm not going to talk about how processes and internal quality assurance should be developed. <laughs> the, that, that could take years, I think. <laughs> All I'm going to do is suggest that there are six key questions that internally will provide us with the answers that keep us stable, provide us with the information that we need, that allow us to be confident and sure that what we're doing is good. Three of those questions are about quality assurance and three of them are about quality improvement. The first three questions are about quality assurance and they're what do you do, why do you do it, and how do you do it? If we're not sure what we're doing and why we're doing it, those are absolutely key to the strategy behind any institution. So any program, any particular direction of an institution saying this is what we do but why are we doing it are we responding to an outside trend are we responding to a need of employers um are we an institution that has a monodisciplinary focus and that's why we're doing what we do the how do you do it is a real knowledge of, of what you're doing to make sure that your program and so on to make sure that this program is using the modules the assessment etc and the teaching that's working for you. So it's the description of how you're doing it. Next slide, please. Whoops, sorry, no, that's it. So the quality improvement questions are, why do you do it like that? How do you know it works? And what do you do to, improvement, to improve it? And I would suggest that those six questions can be used at any level. They can be used at the institutional level. An institution could ask itself those six questions. A program could ask itself those six questions. A program could be looking at the assessment components of one module, and it could use those six questions. Because in the end, what we want to know is what we're doing, why are we doing it? Do we know why we're doing it? How do we know it works? Where are we getting feedback to suggest that it might not be? Uh, and, and what are we trying to do to improve it? We could ask those questions about our stakeholder involvement. Uh, what do we do? Why do we do it like that? How do we know it works? What do we do to improve our stakeholder involvement? You can ask those six questions at any level in a system. And quite often, I think that we've complicated quality assurance to the extent that there are so many acronyms and so many frameworks and processes and so on. And, and they are necessary, but we don't all need to deal with those all the time. I think that what we need to do internally is to respond to those six questions. Of course, it will be a little bit more complicated than that, but I like to—I always like to try and pull back what I'm doing to those questions to try and really simplify and get to the heart of what I'm doing. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is a, a summing up slide. The environment in which we're operating is changing. It changes very rapidly. Quality assurance in higher education is changing. If I just give an example, recently I've been reading about the, the roadmap for the ASEAN higher education space. Um, this is a little bit like our own European higher education area. That's going to bring down the line opportunities for harmonization, opportunities for mutual recognition of qualifications across the region. It's going to bring opportunities for student mobility, staff mobility. From the Bologna process, Europe. And so I can say that I think it's a, a great opportunity and a really great development in the ASEAN region. It's been a pleasure to read about it. But it's going to bring lots of changes. It's also going to bring those opportunities that I've talked about. But in order to have those opportunities, there needs to be some mutual understanding that we care about the quality of what we do. Because if an institution in Malaysia and an institution in Indonesia start to talk and there's no balance between 
the quality assurance, if you like, processes or no harmonization or no, under, no mutual confidence in what each other are doing, then that's not going to work very well. So this process will bring opportunity and it will also bring some, some aspects of development and maybe some requirements to, to even things out in terms of how we decide. The students that we interview during review processes, I can't imagine ever having been one of those students. They are confident, they're literate, uh, they know what they, uh, and quite often they're, they're such a pleasure to talk to, but, but they're changing as well. That student body is changing and we have to almost run to keep up with it. But regardless of the changes, I think it's probably true to say that all institutions, programs, the leadership and that they're keeping up with the trends. I've never met an academic member of staff who didn't care about what they were doing. So even though they might have hated the quality assurance processes, they might have hated what I was standing for, which was director of quality, still, in my mind, actually they were doing quality assurance because they cared about their students and they cared about what they were doing. They just didn't call that quality assurance. And that's where we need to find these means of translation so that those who are responsible for quality at an institution and are responsible to the national agencies also can converse and have some communication open with the academics in their institution as well. It is about doing it right when no one else is looking. That is really important. But it's about doing it right when no one else is looking, not to feed the bureaucratic machine that sometimes external quality assurance can feel like. It's important because we need to create that culture. In, in the end, the students that we have, their education, the fact that they get a degree that is of a, of a, of a good international standard and that we are providing those students with the opportunity to, to achieve the best they can that is the heart of what we're doing. So the purpose of internal quality assurance, it's not about citing, I don't know, all the Nobel Prize winners that you have on the staff. It's not about citing the world-class leading research articles that have been published at your institution. Those are really important things. But the heart of an internal quality assurance process, in order to stabilize us, to keep us in a position where we can respond to whatever challenges and whatever trends are coming at us down the line that we don't know about yet, some of them we do know about them, that's what an internal quality assurance system should be doing. It should be providing an institution with confidence. It makes that institution confident, not because of the world-class stuff, not because of the Nobel Prize winners, but because it knows that the education that it's providing for its students and the level of qualification that it's giving to them and the opportunities that it's providing to them is good and it knows that it has confidence in that because of the internal quality assurance system that it's using and that is the purpose of iqa in a nutshell and it's the reason i think for my belief at the moment having spent a long long time in external quality assurance it's my reason for believing that while we always need external quality assurance it is internal quality assurance that will in the end provide us with what we need to move forward into the future. And my final slide, I think, should say thank you very much in Bahasa, I hope. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Fiona. Uh, we will uh, continue our uh, question and answer at the end. I mean, after the second speaker, we welcome uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Um, Oliver Fittori, I will read uh, his uh, short bio here. Uh, Dr. Oliver Fittori is Dean for Accreditation and Quality Management as well as the Director of the Department for Program Management and Teaching and Learning Support at WU, uh, Vienna University of Economics and Business. He has been working as an expert in the area of quality assurance and higher education development for more than a decade in more than 50 different countries. 
including work for EUA, NQA, ESU, UNESCO, and also EU Share, and various international higher education agency and higher education institution. Dr. Oliver Fettori has been teaching courses on public management, research for methodology, research methodology, organization behavior, and also evaluation theory, as well as the research association at the Institute of Organization Studies. He has authored author dozens of publications in the area of organization theory, organization culture, quality assurance, teaching and learning, and curriculum development. Dr. Fittori has been involved in variety of European project, example as Erasmus and Horizon 2020, and is currently coordinating the teaching and learning activities of the Engage.EU Engage European University Alliance. We welcome Dr. Oliver Fittori. Please, Doctor. Thank you very much. There is nothing as strange and embarrassing than listening to your to your short CV while it's read out. Uh, thank you for, for the invitation and good afternoon, everyone. Good, uh, good morning there, Professor. Thank you. I know that it has been a long day for many of you already. So before I start, uh, could, could you give me a sign of life? So if you're still here and with me for the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes, could you just use your one of your reaction items uh, buttons like I'm doing here and you can send me a thumbs up, uh, a waving hand, whatever, but everyone who's still here with us mentally as well as physically uh, it would be great to see some kind of reaction from you. Very good. That's not the vast majority, but I, uh, I, I'll take that as, a, that as a positive sign. Um, as you see from my background, uh, I can switch it to the to the seminar's background very ah. easily. But with those virtual meetings, I always like to give some impression of space. So what you see in the background, I'm changing it again are pictures of my own campus where I'm currently sitting in Vienna. And I hope it's all right if I share a couple of those impressions with you, because otherwise yeah, it's, it's a very remote experience. No uh, problem, Dr. Fittori, it's okay. Thank you. Fiona, thank you so much for the start. <laughs> and for, for also declaring, I'm going to go into the specifics and details. <laughs> let's, let's see how that works out. Um, as always, I very much appreciate listening to you. There is two tiny areas where I would be great to have a discussion. I'll pick up on them because I think I also slightly differ in my opinion and the positive outlook you have on that. But um, I, I think that's also something to explore a bit a bit later. I try to share the screen on my own. I hope you can see my presentation. Yes, we can see it, Prophet. All right, very good. Um, I'll immediately start. So um, the topic I was given is so vast, I decided to give it a bit of a different spin, but I'm still going to cover the area of IQA and employability. It, basically, I'm going to do it in three parts. I want to connect to what Fiona has started on also on the, risk, on the relationship between IQA and EQA, but also where I see, and then even globally, where I see IQA still um, having some deficits in order to fulfill that, that mission. That, it, that would be the first part, and it's just like laying the groundwork. The second part is very tiny. I'm going to also explain my problems with the employability expectations that we have for IQA. That's very brief. And then I come to something that hopefully will inspire some of you in terms of practices. Um, how can IQA really indeed contribute to improving employability? Having in mind, as you will see from the first two parts, that I'm having some doubts on 
how far we can actually go there. But that, that's that's a different issue. As you see in the title, um, this is the first time I've ever used this uh, this um, acronym. You see, I've titled it EIQA. Now the E here doesn't stand for e-learning or digital or anything. It's really in response to what Fiona was explaining here because part of my message, the biggest part of my message would be if IQA should be able to fulfill the functions that also Fiona was outlining here, taking a bit more of the responsibility that EQA has been taken, then we need a slightly different kind of IQA. And the E here stands for an externally oriented IQA, which is a very different thing, as we will see in a couple of moments. So it's, it is it is still about, as I was given this topic, about shifting paradigms, but with a, a specific spin. Now, because, and that's where, Fiona, that would be my first response to what you were presenting, I see it a bit less optimistic, but then um, I, I, I see it also rather value-free. I don't think that IQA will be able to take on more functions or things that EQA has been traditionally been doing. Because if I take a look at the global development, then I don't see EQA going away ever. Yeah, and that's because it is to very different logics. And that will also be part of what I'm, I'm going to explore. So I, I've never been a fan of IQA and EQA being two sides of the same coin both approaches serve very different goals, very different purposes. So this is indeed about creating a more effective IQA, but my hope is not that it will ever diminish EQA. And if I take a look at the global world, even in the very developed uh, um, quality assurance countries, then I don't see governments easing up. What I see is a shift of what they call it but I see an increasing amount of reporting that higher education institutions have to do. Um, I see countries that for a long time had very autonomous higher education institutions. There's cutbacks on that again. There is whenever a scarcity of funds comes, there's so because it in essence has to do with control and accountability. That's what I want to say. I'm a bit less optimistic that a better IQA is going to ease the burden on EQA, but I'm nevertheless a big fan of actually moving forward with a more effective IQA if that is possible. So, and this is indeed leading into the first part. And, um, and for the first part of the presentation, I'm using a couple of slides I've been using before. Apologies if anyone has ever seen them before. This is just about setting the stage because wh why do, would I opt for a different kind of IQA? If we take a look at the world around us and change is a big issue then we see the world around us is changing so fast. Yeah, if you take a look at the world population, this is, and you'll see in a minute why I chose those 17 years. Um, it's at the moment we're, we're actually beyond 8 billion people at, uh, on earth. So within only 17 years, it's roughly 1.5 billion people more on earth. Yeah, that, that's a big change and that's a big challenge. Um, 17 years ago, I've just read a couple of, of old documents and papers of myself 17 years ago. A lot of the things we're now so used to. Yeah, even my approach to emails was very different then. So this whole digital revolution that is still ongoing, and arguably it, it goes further back. And we've been carrying the brand for now. Yeah. So the last 17 years have been many of those icons you see here. You, most people in this world wouldn't have been familiar with those social media icons 17 years ago, and largely because they were not existent then, or they were just so much of a niche uh, thing that many people, so they didn't become a global phenomenon. All these social media that are changing, even the way we communicate and how our, yeah, and, and are a big challenge to our, uh, to our, the way we, we, we govern and live together, they are a fairly new phenomenon geopolitically, I'm not going there, but there's new countries emerging in the last 17 years. There's, there's changes on a level where it's really about countries disappearing, new countries, new nation states emerging. There's a lot of ongoing things there. What I found fascinating is um, the debate is still going on. Is Pluto a planet or isn't it? But our understanding of the universe is changing. Yeah, even of our solar system, what does it look like? What, so that's constantly changing. 
this famous little icon here uh, on, on, on Bitcoin, yeah, cryptocurrencies 17 years ago were mostly a pipe dream. And I, I remember uh, science fiction novels where those ideas were laid out, but that was nowhere on the table. And this was actually what my campus you see back here was looking 17 years ago. So change is all around us and the world is changing. And that's basically part of my argument for a different kind of IPA. Because if I take a look at quality assurance and the world of quality assurance, and um, I think Fiona knows that the, this argument fairly well by now, you were already referring, Fiona, to the European standards and guidelines or the frameworks uh, similar to that. Now, the first edition, we'll see that in a moment, the first edition was launched even more than 17 years ago. That's also why I chose the 17 years. Yeah. Um, so, um, and it has been revised, but in essence, it has stayed very much the same. So not that much has changed about it. It's still very much considered in the European area, uh, the Bible for that. In ASEAN, you have the, the ASEAN quality assurance framework, and many of that was modeled after what Europe was, has been doing. I, I think that's going to stay because it's very generic and it's very agreeable. Quality culture, everyone is still talking about quality culture. The first big international project on that was launched more than 20 years ago. We could argue how much progress we have made since then. Yeah. So and the term is still still considered so new and, and so fascinating for many. The most cited quality assurance publication globally yeah, um, is the, the famous article that, that Lee Harvey and Dan Green were, were writing this heuristic of different understanding. That was 29 years ago. And still everyone is referring to the same five different understandings of quality as if, yeah, again, the world around us was not changing. The first student evaluations of teaching in Austria were launched 53 years ago. And the debates are still the same. Oh, do students really know what to evaluate? Nothing happens after the results. So that's half a century. Not that much has changed about it, not even the items. And the oldest European QA agency, at least as far as I'm aware of, has been founded 170 years ago. Yeah. Back then, it was obviously not called a quality assurance agency, but it has been continuously doing that work. So the frame start, uh, ch changed a bit. So arguably, and that part of my first argument, the world around us is changing very quickly. QA, not so much. And that has a lot to do with the way we build our IQA systems. And I would argue that's how we build our IQA systems and then how, how we often uh, look at it. You know what this is, yes? So this is, uh, this is one of the still most important Swiss export articles. Yeah, it's, a, it's literally a multi-million dollar industry, uh, Swiss army knives. Um, I'm not sure we have one at home, but I think we will have one at home. Um, it's not just a cute little souvenir, but it comes in so handy. You have this, yeah, and this is sort of standard model. They change a bit. You have different functions, but usually you have a knife, you have something to open the bottle of beer or lemonade, you have a corkscrew, you have a, a small scissors. Yeah, some of them have something to do your nails, whatever. It's it's very much the same. All right, it's very standardized. That's also how we build our IQA systems. Uh, this is a more modern version I found on the back. I find that very, very funny. So I just want, this is what a more modern Swiss Army knife looks like. Yeah, that's when social media comes into the game. And indeed, our IQA systems are not that different. We're talking about one system and they contain standardized elements. Um, I've seen the presentations this morning. Yeah, I, I was not able to attend, but um, um, Yes, Mina was so, so nice to, to share them with me. Um, I saw lots of excellent work being done on surveys and evaluations and surveys is something every one of us is doing. Program level reviews, either voluntarily or because it's externally encouraged, let's say it like this, but this is a staple. Yeah, that, that's a core part of our Swiss Army knives in quality assurance. Quality handbooks, self-assessment reports, staff development processes, and the forever, forever popular PDCA cycles. 
I hardly, I've been doing work for 20 different quality assurance agencies around the, the world. I've been doing consulting work with institutions all around the world. I see these elements everywhere. What I'm, but I'm not so convinced that's a good thing. It helps us to stay in the same dialogue. But what I see is if we build it like a Swiss Army knife, I see two big problems. You can't use the Swiss Army knife in all contexts. Yeah. I'm going through that very briefly, but I think it's something very important to know. So I just chosen four random contexts where I think a Swiss Army knife would not come very handy. Yeah. If you're on the moon, I hardly guess what you would do with that. Uh, if you're, yeah, if you're in the middle of the ocean, thrown out of your plane or whatever, what would you ever do with it? Even here in the, in, yeah, in a, in a Southeast Asian jungle, very much up on a, on a big tree, what would you do with it? In the middle of the desert, I hardly can imagine where it would be. And that's the same for higher education institutions. We built that in a standardized way, but there's so big differences between multidisciplinary and specialized higher education institutions. There's very different needs. So I'll come back to that when it comes to employability. Public versus private. And sometimes I worry, if you know, that was also be something uh, interesting to discuss. I worry when I meet also quality reviewers. And because they come from big European public institutions where it's fashionable to say there can't be total quality management. Oh, that's something that, but if you're a small private institution, tuition based and you work like a company, why shouldn't total quality management work for you or all those? So th there's so many differences and we tend to ignore them. Yeah, also big versus small higher education institutions, internationally oriented versus local higher education institutions. So ju just briefly on that. But the bigger problem, and that's, that's more on, on what we're discussing today is it's not suitable for all the purposes. If you're a very good lock picker, that should be able to help us achieve better ranking positions, raise stakeholder satisfaction. We're serving people all the time, but that's not making them happier. Yeah. Um, meeting accreditation standards, you need different instruments for that. You don't need service. And pro you need those instruments in place for some standards, but it's not going to meet all the external standards just through the instruments alone. And most notably, because it's important for today, I can't see most of those instruments help us improve employability. So what is the alternative then? I would be the first part, and I hope, um, I hope that will already spark some discussion later. The second part is, as I said, very brief. And I've been arguing that for decades also within Europe, there's some very good papers on that, but very often people forget that employability does not equal employment. So the good news is for higher education institutions, we're kidding ourselves if we think we're going to save the economies by just improving the skills of our graduates. And there's two very important things that we need to keep in mind. I don't know about universities in Indonesia that well, but most universities know worldwide. By the time a new curriculum gets implemented and graduates have developed skills that they might use in the work, that's sometimes a decade of delay. Yeah, because first that needs to, and by, you just declare in the curriculum, but you need textbooks for that. You need approaches. You need to educate your teachers to actually go in that direction. And then your graduates have to go through the program first, and then they have to ad apply their skills somewhere in the environment. So that's nothing that we change from one day to the next. But even more importantly, whenever I see um, in countries the discourse on uh, we need to change something in high education because employment rates are not high enough, or, but that's a matter of the national economy or even global economy. There's a, yeah, if you see the effects COVID had, that's not on higher education institutions and the lack of skills. That's big changes in our economies. Now, I'm not saying we don't graduates attractive enough for the labor market. Do they have the things that the labor market are seeking? It's not the same. Are they able to change the labor market? Are they able to yep, uh, reinvent our societies? So that's that's the short second part. But I think for me, it's very important to keep those two things separate. 
And if you really want to make big changes in the economy, then that's a national endeavor where all the higher education institutions need to work together alongside a national plan. That's about, yeah, that's about national strategies. That's nothing for IQA or one institution and strategy. If it's about carving a niche or about serving your own stakeholders, that is, that's a different thing. But for me, it's, it's yeah, um, two, two very different levels. Now, that was a lot of controversial exposition. And I know a lot of you would be far more interested in but can we do anything practical? <laughs> so for the third part, as I promised, um, I'll leave the more controversial part and I'll share with you my thoughts on what we can do, what at my institution we're already doing, what I'm, I'm sharing with colleagues, what some other colleagues at other institutions um, um, internationally are doing, and going back to the PDCA cycle. And now, um, Fiona, this would be the second part where there would be a slight disagreement. I'm using the PDCA cycle because it's such a nice model to discuss because you don't need to explain the, the PDCA cycle, but I think it's the most overrated and useless part of any QA system because the PDCA cycle it's such does nothing. It's just a model. Yeah? And it's a model to explain something. But um, I think we're too stuck on that. So still for, 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 for today, I, I just want to put this model, that cycle in the service of improving employability and take a look at what that would mean for an IQA system. And then coming back to the point why I think we need to be more externally. Because what we do a lot is we do a lot of navel gazing. Yeah. So all these surveys and all these instruments are always focusing inside of the institution. But if we want to support the planning part and we want to, then it's not about serving our teachers or students or taking a look at the programs. It's about taking a look outside. Um, my, my department in essence consists of seven different units. And uh, one of the units I have, it's, it's called the Evaluation and Quality Enhancement Unit. And the the head of this unit, um, he was not the main reason why I hired him, but one of the things that very much spoke to me is when I hired him, he already had a, a, a career in research behind him and his PhD, he had been doing by um, programming a tool that was able to examine, to, to bring in data, actually to, 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 to draw data uh, from um, job advertisements yeah so going through the going through the catalogs and the databases of job advertisement companies but also big companies that were advertising trying to look for patterns what are they looking for in those job advertisements and i found that fascinating i thought that's a very very good thing for our QA. instead of asking companies yeah and hr and saying what do you think you need and you always get the same generic answers. And then you take a look at what they're actually looking for in their job ads. And this differs from what they're explaining us in the interviews. So what we have started and uh, what we're increasingly doing in communities um, uh, with, with our partner institutions is we're increasingly trying to look for evidence outside of our institution. What are companies looking for? How, but this coming back to the employment argument is also about how is the labor market changing? What, what is happening? So I do believe a more effective IQA unit does not just need to collect data from inside the institution. What you need are people who take a look at international trends, who take a look, who understand how the national or international labor market works, who see, who do understand how that links to e each other. Yeah, and sometimes this is very important also in terms of taking a strategic view. Just sharing an anecdote with you. Um, for the last couple, we, we are we are by far the biggest provider of, of business degrees and and uh, business in, in Austria and and actually beyond. But for the last fifteen years, we have sometimes struggling because we didn't have um, enough senior faculty there or a delay in rehiring them. So HR as arguably one of the more important areas of, of business. Um, um, we were not, 
we were not focusing that much on HR and HR education. Now, in itself, we are offering 25 different programs. We're offering 32 specializations within our biggest program. So in itself, that was a tiny issue, not a big problem. And because from a research point of view, not everyone was that happy about HR, it's not so fascinating as other areas, um, not so fashion, no one was that much worried about it. But there's a whole sector of high education institutions in Austria called University of Applied Sciences. And many of them, because they're very close to the labor market, were starting to offer HR degrees. Now, again, per se, not a problem for us. We are still the institution with the most students in the field. We're overrun. We have seven applications per study place, not a problem. So why do I get worried from an IQA perspective? Because the HR managers in institutions usually have an HR education background. And increasingly, they come from other institutions than our own. And as we know from research, people tend to recruit people who are similar to themselves, who they know from context that they know. So the more recruiters, job recruiters we have that have not been educated in our own institutions, the more difficult it gets in some cases to get our own graduates into those companies. That's what I'm talking about when I say assisting the planning part has to take a different viewpoint, has to bring in different kind of state that has to do different things. I've been stuck for quite some time now with this. So this is um, why we need different kind of analysis and not doing so much self-reporting data and not need, or not should not be stuck with our Swiss Army lives. The second part to me is even more important. And we're quite lucky at VU. We're a very big university, yeah? around 23,000 students, which is the fourth biggest in, in Austria, but we're only focused on, on business and, and um, and economics related issues and degrees. But we're lucky in a different way because we have an administrative structure where QA is closely intertwined with program development and teaching and learning everything. And that helps a lot because if we follow the logic of the PDCA cycle, and if we now understand a bit better what we need, then it's by far not done with staff development or anything there. Then we need to really rethink education a bit. I, I really like that picture. That's why I smuggled it in here. Um, this is where I see this is what the future of education in a way will look like. Yeah. More mentoring and cross-mentoring. Um, and what I like about the picture is I'm not sure who teaches whom in this picture. And that has to do with the changing world we have here. Yeah. So increasingly, we have students who are better in a lot of things. We are kidding ourselves by talking we need more digital skills. Our students bring in the digital skills. What they need is an idea on how to apply them and how to connect them and how to understand them a bit better. So it's not about educating them about digital skills. On the other hand, they still need guidance. So we really need to rethink competency if employability is about responding to environmental changes in a way. And that links to other things as well. Increasingly, the knowledge we impart is fragmented. So we need our students to be able to work together across disciplines. Now, hands up, who has more than just a couple of initiatives on interdisciplinary teaching or whatever, really, who has really labs where students from different disciplines work together solving a joint problem or something like that. This is increasingly something that's needed, and that requires big changes. That's not just a curriculum change. That's a change of the educational model. Knowledge is exponentially growing. So what we need is ideas on how to actually deal with this complexity and the dynamics in which knowledge is changing. For the last 30 years, everyone keeps talking about lifelong learning. But in essence, it requires a rethinking of this lifelong learning itself. You see all the movements on uh, micro credentials and everything. I think that's going to be a big, big game changer, but not because it's a new education offer, but because upskilling and reskilling becomes a, a really important thing. And that requires us to rethink yeah, even stackable degrees. And for QA, that changes the world. It is not a three-year program anymore, but you accumulate credits over a, a, a time of 10 to 15 years. How do you deal with that? 
And I'm not going into globalization because you're very, uh, you're all very, very aware of that. But that also requires, of course, very different education models. And so does the whole digital transformation of our societies and economies. But rethinking that kind of education, that's what the doing is about. It's not about asking an employer and then you make changes to a few learning outcomes in the course and then you make changes to a textbook. That's not reaching far enough if you really want to meet the employability issue. And moving forward, because I know I'm already talking um, um, a long time and don't, don't worry, I'm, I'm approaching the end. Um, the tech part, again, I don't think we should rely that much on self-reporting data. We should go beyond that. There's a lot of very interesting stuff on tracer analysis. So, and you, you can do those two different ways. You can trace your own graduates with the help of LinkedIn, whatever, seeing what they're doing in a longer term career trajectory, understanding their careers, understanding what is changing. But what a lot of institutions are doing is they're interviewing or, or serving their students right after graduation and then maybe three to five years later, and that's about it. But if you take this model of employability and lifelong learning seriously, then you need a far longer perspective on, on staying in contact with them and understanding what they need. But you can also take it a different way. What a very interesting side project we started a couple of years ago was taking a look at specific job or career markets. So uh, instead of tracing graduates, and we have a lot of graduates, yeah, we have about 3,500 of them every year, so you can't trace all of them individually. Um, but what we did is we took a look at the top 500 Euro, uh, Austria companies and then all the prime market listed companies. We researched, investigated all the CVs of the leaders of these companies, so CEOs, CFOs, uh, CIOs, and we took a look at where they got their education from in order to understand about those high career, top career people. And we were very happy to discover that um, we are by far the most important education provider for those companies. So about 25% of the prime market business companies have managers, top managers with a degree from our institution. Yeah, the second ranked university comes uh, with, with a share of about 12%. So that was good. But if we take a look at Germany, the picture is very different. Yeah, we, we barely factor there. So this is also a different look at, at, at international impact. And this is just about arguing, we need to be a bit more creative there and use different kinds of data. The biggest thing we're working at the moment is actually working with the databases of two professional career database providers and try to match those career data with our own graduate data to understand a bit better of what happens there. And this leads me to the final part, and this is just an excurs to share with you the, 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 the latest stuff we've been doing. Um, more and more, I, and this leads back to uh, where I think um, the whole employability issue falls a bit short. More and more, it is about really understanding and exploring the impact and the limits of the impact you have as a higher education institution. So about three years ago, we started a lot of initiatives and projects to monitor the deep impact we're having, deep impact in terms of um, yeah, long-term impact, following people more with a qualitatively oriented methodology, try to link that to our mission and reconstruct impact pathways yeah so really understand what do our graduates do 10 5 10 15 20 years after they have graduated and how is that linked to what we have learned from us and broad impact this is more broader this is the areas with the databases and data mining that i was mentioning yeah and this is just one example of of a couple of dozens that we have been working on but just to, to share that. So the way we increasingly think, and that helps us to improve our processes, and that helps us to rethink our IQA is in the way of impact pathways. So there's a lot of things we're doing, and there's an output. Yeah, as I said, we have around 3,000, a bit more uh, graduates every year. But taking a look at what they actually do, the actual impact they're having, that's becoming more important. That's how we also discovered that 24% out of the 500 most influential people in the Austrian business world 
are credits from our institution. 12, yeah, uh, about 16% of the most, 500 most influential people in, in society have a degree from our institution. Now, this per se is nice to know and to advertise it, but what we now do, and that links to IQAs, we monitor that. Because once the chair is decreasing, I would start to get worried. I'm not sure we can increase it easily, but if it starts decreasing, we're starting to lose relevance. And uh, this is something that uh, we try. I'm not going for the sake of time into the research issues. Um, instead, I keep my promise and, and just end here. The basic point I really wanted to make is um, in agreement with about 95% of what, what Fiona was saying. And I think with the rest, Fiona, we could easily come to an agreement because uh, we, we never differed that much in, 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 in logic. I do believe we need a strong IQA, but again, not in order to ease the burden on EQA, but I do believe the future of a strong IQA is something that is about looking outward. What is happening outside of the institution, what is needed there, bring this knowledge and these findings in on each step of the quality assurance process and to this help our institutions to improve employability, to stay relevant and to stay effective or become more effective. And that's about it, and I'm very happy about discussing that now and looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Oliver Vettori. Um, before we continue to the question and answer uh, session, I will give a brief uh, summary from uh, Ms. Fiona and also from uh, Dr. Vettori. Uh, from doc, uh, from Ms. Fiona, the biggest trend in a sh is a shift from EQA to IQA, and to we uh, the EQA, yeah, and then uh, what is the impact of EQA and IQA? Yeah, of course. You know, I think about what we are doing and why. EQA three countries still use EQA, but EQA shift to outcomes. Therefore, IQA become more important in this case. IQ system, they often seek to produce evidence be required to respond to do it in uh, also in our uh, study program. Um, and also um, the EQA accreditation or evaluation visit and sometimes too bureaucratic. Uh, so we should make IQA uh, simple. You suggest for IQA, what do, why do we do it? And how do we do it? Why do you, why do, you do it like that? How do you know it, it works? And last part is what do you do to improve it? Uh, no, uh, the 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 one of the uh, one of the portion that I really like is doing it right when no one else is looking is important. That's uh, from Ms. Yona and the other one from Dr. Oliver. Uh, IQA cannot be replaced with uh, EQA. Better IQA is a must. The world around us is changing fast. For example, we have digital revolution, social media, and geopolitic changing. And also, uh, IQA needs modern, call it Swiss Army tools, which includes in uh, part is social media and other elements that needs a very situation and context, such as multidisciplinary versus specialized uh, higher education. However, sometimes even Swiss Army nice won't work for a specific situation. Employability doesn't equal employment. Need to understand, we need to understand the job market. Uh, HR used to recruit, we know that uh, most of the time, HR used to recruit people like their own. And uh, they thinking the education, education is about, uh, is for everybody. It's about mentoring and learning how to collaborate and cooperate. This is more matters in this case. The research study might help, but also input from employers. Uh, 
also needed and try to match their need, the employer needs and our graduate is more important. The deep impact uh, is teaching and for teaching and research and then find the graduate impact. That's uh, the, the example and also the uh, uh, the experiment from experience from the University of uh, W. You. Uh, that's a uh, recap uh, from some sum up from both uh, speakers. Then uh, we'll give uh, the floors times to uh, uh, ask question. Anybody wants to ask question, please. You can raise hands uh, and ask uh, directly to uh, our speakers. Anybody? Can I ask a question? Yes, please, Ibu. Uh, yes. Kok gemak ya? Mungkin ada laptop lain right. di sebelah, Ibu. Okay, I'm silahkan. inside the room. I have to go out there. Huh? Sorry. I have to leave the room. Thank you very much, Fiona and Dr. Oliver, for uh, your very uh, experience, sharing of your experiences. I have several, uh, I have one statement that I would like to also to join with you, is that looking at the diversity of the uh, higher education institutions in Indonesia, I don't think, uh, in the long run, we still have to have EQA um, besides the IQA. The external is still needed in our country since the diversity of the characteristics of the uh, higher education institution in Indonesia with a diverse location and things like that. I guess most of you know about it. So I agree very much that maybe for several years, the future, 15, 20 years, Oh, hopefully not 20. Let's say five or 10 years, we still have to need IQA together with EQA. That's one statement. Another is that uh, I think you've mentioned about the importance of the uh, establishment or the development of the quality culture from both of you. I would like to have your uh, experience uh, from each of you. How do we measure? quality culture. I mean, is there any specific uh, dimensions or aspects that is included or as the core of, uh, of uh, what we consider as quality culture? Uh, that is my main question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ibu, it is a question for uh, Ms. Fiona or for uh... Dr. Oliver? I'm happy to let you go first, Fiona. <laughs> I, there's a couple of thoughts I want to share on that, but I'm happy to have you go first. Okay. Okay. I think the first thing to say is I was probably so enthusiastic about my rebalancing that I must have given the impression that I was suggesting that EQA should definitely disappear. I'm not. <laughs> uh, my 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 premise is that if we're doing things for ourselves, for our own reasons, for our own internal assurance, we should be rebalancing internal okay. and external quality assurance. But I am not suggesting that external quality assurance yes. disappears. Okay. As I said in the presentation, external quality assurance will always, I think personally, always be needed as an independent external check because yeah. why should the, you know, why should the public believe what i tell them they yeah. will much rather believe what an independent external is saying yeah. so external qa has a role it will always have a role so i don't think oliver and i are too far apart on that okay <laughs> but my my personal view is that internal quality assurance at the moment 
is merely a response to external quality assurance. Quite often, it's a response because it's, it's seen, it's perceived to be bureaucratic, it's perceived to be time consuming, academic staff are busy, and this is true, I know it's true. And therefore, they don't really want to be dealing with something that they, for, from their perspective, has no value. So mm -hmm. my premise is that if we are to face up to the trends and the challenges of the future, having a more stable and robust internal quality assurance that doesn't just respond to the external stuff, but is for us as an individual institution, whether private or public, large or small, you tailor that IQA system to your circumstances because that's what will make it work. Not as Oliver said, if it's the generic Swiss Army pen knife, oh, one size fits okay. all. That that won't work. And I've I, one of the things I used to love working with when, when I was at QAA was I really liked carrying out the external reviews of the small and specialist institutions, so the music conservatoires, the art colleges. They were my favourites because. They were so focused on what they were doing, but their internal quality assurance systems, you couldn't really have called it an internal, there was no system, but whatever they were doing, it worked because the outcomes and the output was so evident and so clear. So that's my first point. The second point is that the other thing that I used to love to work with at QAA was when I went to an institution, we had a, a system of external evaluation or audit of universities. So we, we didn't do program accreditation. Um, so it was a, a more of a, an enhancement focused process, but nonetheless, institutions really took it seriously. They worked very hard to prepare and so on. But the best kind of institution were the ones who, who could sit with the panel, the review panel, mm -hmm. and they'd prepared and they were nervous, but they were confident enough to discuss their, their their obstacles and their challenges with you. So if the panel finds something out, there was one institution in particular, we would find out that they'd actually awarded degree certificates to students who hadn't earned them. Now, this is a big, that's a big problem if you're giving a degree certificate to a student that hasn't actually succeeded. And we thought, well, what shall we do? And the panel, we decided as a panel that we would just go and talk to the institution about this and say, look, you know, we've, we've discovered this. And that institution, it's a very well-respected university, basically didn't try to cover it up. They just yeah. put their hands up and said, ah, thank you. We needed yeah. to know that and we need to do something about it. But they were confident enough to do that. They were confident enough that, that they had processes in place, that this was not something that happened all the time. Uh, they were confident enough to just put their hands up and say, hmm, Thank you. That's a big error on our part. Uh, other institutions, it's true, also demonstrated confidence where they would say, you know, we, we don't agree with your line of thought because we're doing it, we're doing what we want, but we're doing it like this. We're not doing it the way you're suggesting. We're doing it like this, and this is how we know it works for us. Mm -hmm. To be the confidence of an institution to be able to say that right. is very mm -hmm. important. And that's where my building up of confidence through internal quality assurance comes. If we're just doing it for the external purposes, then we will never yeah. build a quality right. culture. That's like right. culture. Agreed. Yeah. Quality culture, how to measure it? <laughs> it's the most difficult thing in the world. <laughs> it's okay. really hard. Okay. Re really hard. I don't think I ever succeeded in that uh, when I was a director of quality. Um, but all I will say, and I'll hand over to Oliver, all I will say is that I think that it, that quality culture might be measured through the uh -huh. success of the internal quality assurance oh, process. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Those processes, I keep talking about them. Plan, do, check, act. Well, Oliver's right. It's just a model. Uh, and if oh. you don't know what you're planning and you don't know what you're doing and you don't know what you're checking, then it won't work. So really, oh. it's, it's, it's finding out what will work for you uh, and I'm, I'm not going to dictate that. Um, there are models out there. That, that's why I like these six key questions, because you can just ask yourself, you know, this program, what are we doing it? Why do we do it? Mm -hmm. know, how do we know it's good? What are our graduation results like? Mm -hmm. You know, why do we do it like that? Should we be looking to our stakeholders and asking them if we should be doing something different? That's internal quality assurance. 
and that's using those six questions. Oliver, I'm going to leave the quality culture bit to you. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I, I'll be very brief on that. There is there is a couple of of um, there has been research done on that. So there's a couple of approaches on how to measure quality culture, most notably uh, from a, a group at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. Mm -hmm. Now I come to the but. Um, I've been doing a lot of, 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 of uh, research and scholarly work on quality culture. All these approaches work as with every measurement because mm -hmm. they simplify the reality. So in essence, mm -hmm. they break it down to a couple of psychological variables yes. and, uh, yeah, and a couple of... And I, I believe that's not, not very useful. Yeah, because mm -hmm. that, so I, there, are, there are models out there how to measure quality culture. Mm -hmm. I would encourage you not to use them, not to try to measure quality culture because okay. essence, quality culture, like the PDCA cycle, is an idea and a model. And what it helps, mm -hmm. if you take a look at literature, it helps to shift the attention from the more technical psychology involved, and yeah, uh, and organizations are different. This is beautiful and important. So it means you never build your quality assurance system just as a technical system like you would in a company that produces cars. But that's as far as the quality culture concept is useful because as soon as you try to put it down, it becomes oh, one more fact finder. Yes, yeah, agree. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Hutati, and also uh, Dr. Oliver and Ms. Fiona. Uh, is there any question from the floor, please? Maybe it's while we're waiting for a more question from the floor, I want to ask uh, what uh, we we now in uh, our uh, in my faculty economics and business, we we will have a visit from uh, HSB uh, ERT next month early next month and we now are preparing and what we feel that uh as you mentioned uh Ms. fiona mentioned that we learn a lot from uh the eqa uh, especially ssb for our own uh especially for example for our lectures uh quality and also our teaching and uh I agree with you, uh, EQA will still uh, need and uh, that will be one of the one of the or the, the pillars for uh, for higher education to learn about more, learn more about quality assurance and develop their own uh, IQA. So it will be uh, it will be more uh, specific to their own uh, needs. Uh, uh, what do you think about that, uh, Ms. Oliver, and also, um, I mean, uh, Ms. Fiona, and also Dr. Oliver? Well, certainly, it, it sounds exactly like it. It sounds like a perfect model in some respects, because I think, I do think that the role of the quality assurance agencies is changing. Um, and if they are learning from them or learning from EQA would have been quite difficult because they were seen, I, I speak certainly from my own context, I, I can't speak for everyone's context, but they would have been seen very much as, if not quite the enemy, they certainly weren't your friend. <laughs> so I think that, that that culture is shifting. And this is exactly my point. And it's, it's interesting that, Oliver, one of the things you said that really caught my attention, after 50 years, I think you said, we're still having the same debates about the same things. <laughs> and in some respects, that, that makes me think that either those aspects are the really important things, 
But what we're not doing is shifting how we approach them and shifting how we deal with them or that there's something really, really wrong if we can't actually move on from having those debates. So I haven't quite decided which of those two I come down on. Yeah. Um, but I think, I, I think if the external quality assurance is providing a benefit that is allowing for learning, if it's providing a mirror that allows you to reflect on what you're doing, to look at yourself, and it is true, you know, agencies themselves in Europe and in the ASEAN region, Bampete and Lampetekes have recently oh. done this, they have been reviewed. And I was responsible for writing QAA's self-evaluation when we were reviewed with a project group, it wasn't just me. It is the hardest thing in the world. It's a really hard thing to do, to write a document that represents you to an external panel. Yeah, but the... And I suppose my, my view of it is, how is that process being carried out? Because if you're if you're doing it in a way that is allowing you to learn about yourself and you're thinking, you know, writing this, you're finding that really difficult. Is it because of is it because of us or is it because the external criteria are wrong? I, I, I don't know. But it's a very To be as honest as you can, then if the external process is is one that requires a tick box approach, where you're just saying, do they meet this tick, tick, tick? For me, that's less valuable, but I understand that in some circumstances, it, it's what needs to be done. For example, to accredit a medical program, you need to make sure that the resources are there, that they have the right laboratories, et cetera, et cetera. So, it, it's a really tricky one, but I think that any external process that allows you to reflect and that you are seeing a benefit from is valuable. My own suggestion is that the benefit then can be translated into your own internal processes so that the next time it's easier and easier to respond to the external requirements. But also as those external requirements change, you've actually got quite a good stable basis on which you gather your information about what you're doing, why you're doing it and so on. I'm not really sure I've answered the question there, but uh, Oliver, maybe you could uh, <laughs> help me out. <laughs> I, I, I think you did. You, you did answer it beautiful from my from my point of view. So just a adding to two things, I think that there is also too much adversity, and that that's not what I wanted to feel. Too much adversity towards EQA. I enjoy. I, it's a lot of work, but I enjoy our encounters with EQA. I just take them as what they are. <laughs> yeah. So this is, and that's not necessarily something that improves our organization. Or if, if it does, then because we are lucky with the reviewers that we are sent, and they have some ideas that we can work with, and sometimes their ideas are just stupid. Yeah. So sometimes we've been working really hard in digesting what they had given us and because they were lending the legitimacy of the agency we couldn't do anything about it so you digest it you know fully well it's stupid it's not useful it's not what you can do so true. that will always help that will always happen but on the other hand sometimes we get very good ideas on a more systematic level and i think that links to my own presentation where we benefit a lot from eqa is by taking a look at their criteria catalogs and what they want from us because in essence what this is is a translation of community-based or society or politically driven expectations and we we have we are accredited by four different agencies yeah we did that we do that on our own so we're, we're just stupid um, but some of those agencies are so much focusing now on sustainability and responsibility because that's what is driven in the community. And by taking a look at what they want from us, we learn a lot about expectations from the environment. Yeah. But this has nothing to do with the review as such, yeah, that can go well or not so well. So that's just what I wanted to add. And, and Fiona, because it just triggered something, um, that would be a very interesting discussion on why, why there is so little progress in a way, yeah, I think some things have changed, but I think part of that has to do with the differences between individual learning and organization learning. And what I see is, even if our students after four years do understand a bit better about what they do with the feedback was possible and not, they leave the institution and the next 
generation comes and starts from scratch again in terms of I give my feedback why is the course not changing overnight or those things and the same happens with lecturers and the same happens with managers yeah because it's not as if as a community we're making the same kind of learning progress all the time yeah it's us as individuals and some things are just flawed logics so we'll you will find so many professionals who think that based on a survey you yeah. take out the results and change something mm -hmm. which every decent researcher will tell you you can't okay thank you uh oliver and fiona uh do we have any question from the floor wait a minute uh yeah it's ready to say this uh butia thank you uh thank you Bu Bu Sh uh, Shari. uh Good afternoon, uh, Fiona and uh, Fiona and Oliver. Uh, thank you for joining us, and I'm sorry because I'm keep bothering you with my emails for preparing this this webinar. So we are very ha happy that finally that we can uh, we can meet. Uh, I have uh, one actually one one questions to Fiona and one question also to to Oliver. Um, I'm very interested on your idea, but keep it simple because I'm also from the economics and and uh, business uh, faculty. So kiss, keep it simple, stupid is one of the the key the, the key point when we want to uh, convey our our message to our our students. But then, uh, if uh, in in the in the in the sense of uh, quality assurance, we are in the boat. We have already discussed between external quality assurance and internal. The external quality assurance, to be honest, in in Indonesia is still burdensome. It's still very bureaucratic. And then on the other hand, we are facing into the employability is a very agile changing changing world so my question is especially i think uh, uh, to viona how uh, how can we make the the keep it up and, and try to apply the sixth question also uh, uh, like your sixth question to develop this this ika to 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 keep it very simple and then but then in also at the same time can answer the because we cannot uh, we still have to live with the eka right but still can answer the the burden sum the from the the external quality assurance that's uh, that's my 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 first questions and my second question uh, uh to i think specifically for uh, uh for oliver uh you mentioned about the the the, the path because uh as, as bushari or or also mentioned we are currently under the uh the our faculty is uh, currently uh, will be visited by the peer review team by by next month and one question is on the impact and uh, you you give an example on on the uh, on your business school and how to measure impact then my question is how can we really show that this impact is because of our uh, our, uh, our 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 study so can we take credit so for example the, the 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 things that we put in in the impact of this AASB we say that our uh, researcher uh, has an in uh, has a part in in developing the law of certain things in the Ministry of Finance, something like that. And most of the our graduate is currently it's in the higher position in the business and also in the government officials. But can we take credit uh, of that? And is it part of the quality issue or because of it is the the person itself? That's that's, that's also the, the question that sometimes we uh, in doubt in when we are, want to put uh, impact because impact is different with outcome. It's beyond outcome right uh, our our quality assurance is still measuring even output not outcome yet now now we are talking about uh, uh, impact which is, is which is beyond that so that's uh, that's uh, my question especially to oliver so i think i think that's the the question for me bu shari thank you thank you butia uh, please um fiona and <coughs> oliver do you want to re uh, answer Oliver, would you like to go first this time with your? I think actually you could probably say a little bit about the first one as well. I, I also have some points to make, but you go first. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I'll still start with the second question, so you can can can, can then uh, link more easy. Um, measuring impact is even from a researcher's point of view. Um, it's not like in natural sciences where you do an experiment. So it's basically like in social sciences and economic sciences, what you end up will be a construct. Mm. In any way. I'm not saying a fabrication, I'm not saying an invention, but I think we can agree that most of what you do in social sciences is you try to approach reality through some methods. And then you can argue, is it an exact 
Mm. Or would it, so and I, that, that's how we approach impact. So is there a directly observable causal relation? In most cases, no, because mm. people also later in their career, I mean, they're also the products in a way of their environment and other influences. And we could always argue, yeah, people who enter an elite university like Harvard, is it Harvard or is it the fact that they came from a, a, from a, a usually very privileged background mm, already yes. with suitable networks and then those networks get reinforced in the, in the institute? So this is a very complex discussion, but you can work with plausibility and probability. Mm. And some things are easy to, to track. And now you are using another example. Um, we have a master's degree in business education. So in terms of output, we know we have about 90 graduates every year. The majority of them will become teachers in secondary schools. And that's nice. From an outcome logic, that's all right. Yeah, they stay in the, they, they do what the government needs them to do, what the schools need them to do. From an impact logic, we want to pursue it further and say, okay, but, but what does that mean? And then we saw that basically, the vast majority of teachers in the eastern part of Austria have a, an education in our institution when it comes to business education. Mm -hmm. And then we did the math and took a look at how many pupils are there educating every year. Mm -hmm. And suddenly realized that through one institute alone, we indirectly reached through the way we approach business education. A five digit number of high school students every year. So this is how we, and this has nothing to do, now you can still argue, this has nothing to do with quality yet. Mm. But what it shows is, and that, that it becomes something interesting because it basically means that basically everyone attending a school with some business or economic subjects in the Eastern part of Austria, yeah, with a population of about 3.5 million people. They get the knowledge apart from teachers who get their knowledge from our institution and also the way how they teach. Now that's an interesting angle. So what I'm saying is in terms of methodology, you have to find your own way when it's about impact. And that's how we do that. And each impact pathway we treat a bit differently in terms of methodology. But even if the causality is not always directly yeah, uh, easy to establish, you can still find out some intriguing things by like just follow the artifact or follow the graduate and calculate that further. So that would be my answer. I hope it was partly helpful. Yeah. And uh, I'd love if you if you want, uh, Tia, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to send you also the links to our impact maps and to our impact methodology. And you can take a look at what we're doing because we're using that, of course, also in the context of our own ACSB uh, accreditation. Um, to the first question, I'm very brief there because that then links to, to Fiona. Um, I see keeping it simple is very misleading. What I do think what we need to keep simple is messages, stories, and the overall model because we can't, that's also what we tell people. People need simple stories in order to understand the world. That's why we need to keep it simple, also QA. The data mechanisms behind it and the methodologies don't need to be simple. They need to be accurate. So that's a very different thing. But what I do think is we need to keep our systems not simple, but lean. And I think that's something we very often don't adhere to. Um, we are currently having a discussion on what service we can actually cut back on and what reports, because the data doesn't change from year to year. And we're producing all these reports and all the day. It's not because it's irrelevant, but it's not changing. We're not learning anything new, but it's still using up time from the people producing it, from the people reading it. So keeping it lean means if an instrument or a process doesn't fulfill a really clear function, even if it's just by law you need it, mm. then we need to cut it back. And I think most of our systems are growing too much. And I've seen institutions proudly presenting that they are doing 20 different surveys. And my question would be, that's impressive. And my question would be, is that efficient? Is that effective? And do you really need that? Could two services do the same trick? 
if you got rid of all the questions that you're never actually interpreting anyway? Okay, that's about my answer. Okay. Thank you, Oliver. I think, um, yeah, the keeping it simple. I, I will, I will stick to my argument about keeping it simple. And I, I actually appreciate Oliver. You're, you're absolutely right. There is, I think there are two things at stake. The, the first is indeed a set of mechanisms and processes and so on that sit underneath what it is that we need to know. You're absolutely right. Keeping those lean. And, and people have been talking about lean processes for a long time, but if they strip out, usually whenever you apply a lean, you know, a lean process to, a, or a lean um, uh, theory to a process, people strip out a tiny little bit of it because they convince themselves that they need everything else. So actually, it's I've seen it work not very effect, in a not very effective way uh, in a university. Um, the keeping it simple. The other side of that is why are you doing it at all? why do we have any kind of quality assurance at all okay public confidence and so on there's all the external arguments but but it but keeping it simple is about the questions that you ask yourself i'm fairly convinced I, I should say actually i didn't make up these six key questions the six key questions were originally described well they were i originally saw them around about 28 years ago and it was a former chief executive of the quality assurance agency in the united kingdom who at the time was also president of the european association for quality assurance his name was peter williams and he was the first person that i ever saw who who sort of said this this is quality assurance and this is quality enhancement that's it and i i really like this and i've held on to it ever since mainly because it is what you need to know. We, we are saying, you know, in relation to what we do, whether it's a, an institution, a program, um, the finance office, the HR office, it's what do you do? Why do you do it? How do you do it? Why do you do it like that? How do you know it works? What do you do to make it better? And whatever the processes or frameworks or data collection and so on that comes in behind that, that's the core of what you need to know. I would say it, it is the core of what you need to know in relation to our activities as higher education professionals. So that, that's my personal view on, on, on the questions. In relation to the external quality assurance, Tia, and it's a pleasure to see you again. We were able to have a coffee in Jakarta in June and it was really, really nice to meet. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that was great. Um, in relation to the external quality assurance, and I, I know it looks, it is bureaucratic, Quality assurance systems are bureaucratic quite often, the external ones, and they're often bureaucratic because they are dealing with so many different programs and institutions and types of institutions and so on. But I know that in Indonesia, you have a, a, a set of standards in your external quality assurance system. And I would suggest that, that there are almost two exercises to be done. One is looking at each of the standards that you're required to respond, respond to externally and applying those six questions to each of the standards the other exercise is an internal one where you're actually doing it for yourselves if you can do them in parallel then that's great but i think what you might find is that actually there's a significant amount of overlap between what you would like to know internally and what you're required to respond to externally um but i i in terms of keeping it simple i would i would take those questions and in the first instance, apply them to the standards that you're required to respond to through your accreditation processes externally. I think it gives a, it, it might not do the full job, but it gives a really good starting point. And it's certainly for us in, in QAA, and when I worked at uh, University College Cork in Ireland, the starting point of writing any self-evaluation, which is usually a requirement in external quality assurance, asking yourself what you do, why you do it, and how you do it is really useful because we all know it's ingrained in us we know what we do we know how we do it but trying to explain it to somebody outside it forces you to explain properly to this group of external peers who will come in so i would suggest that actually those questions are as useful in, as, as a starting point for approaching your external accreditation processes as they are for an internal one at least as a starting point thank you Thank you, thank you, Hannah and Oliver. And Oliver, please, if you uh, please kindly send the the, uh, the method that you mentioned on the on the impact uh, evaluation. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Butia, and also Fiona and Oliver. Uh, do we have any question from the floor? Yeah. Anybody want to ask question? Ibu uh, Denny Riana, Riyama, please, Ibu. Yes. Uh, thank you, Bu Shari. Uh, I want to also uh, maybe uh, my question is uh, a little bit uh, more technical than the other the question, but I want to uh, ask to uh, Fiona or maybe also to Oliver. Uh, we we want to make sure the actual working load of our student and also the work, the actual working load of the staff. Uh, do you have uh, an advice, uh, the, the effective way to do for doing that? Oliver, I'm going to suggest you start with this one. Uh, so, so an effective day, uh, way of doing what? I, I was not fully sure I understood the question, sorry. Uh, to to measure the working load of the actual working load lot of student right and also the actual working load of uh, the staff and uh, or lecturer right um that, that's a very complicated question um with regard to the students um we are doing it too too we're doing too little we're starting it now. We agreed with the government to, to renew our efforts there. Um, and and um, with no things, we're experimenting with different methodologies. We're starting then from next year to really try to understand the workload better, but also the workload distribution over the semester. So it's not about the credits and everything. It's really about um, how, the, how our teaching is organized and what kind of problems that creates over the semester and those things. We try to get in there, and that's a fairly complex thing because, um, yeah, we rely on self-report data. With regard to the teachers, it's different because our entire system is built on a specific teaching responsibility or teaching load that in itself is linked to uh, the position and the contract of the people. So we, we monitor that regularly. And um, there's also a vast system in place on when you can get a relief for that or when you get a, a reduction of that, what are the rules for that. And my department is largely responsible for administrating that. So that's a bit easier. We have a framework and a rule, work, uh, rule book for what happens when we're doing that. But again, um, uh, we're not satisfied with the way this fully works at the moment because we feel it's too intransparent with all the rules and all the laws. So we're working now on a way to decentralize that a bit more and to make sure that everyone in the institution fully understands mm -hmm. how this is working and why. And if you were on maternity leave for such a, what does that mean for your teaching load? If you have a position for 67%, what does it mean for your teaching? So give, give a bit of a better picture uh, about that. We're working on that at the moment. Yeah, but overall, we have a, a system for teachers that is effective and for staff and for students, something that uh, deserves some renewed attention. I don't think I have anything really to add to that. The only thing I would say mm -hmm. is just, just an example from a recent review that I did of an institution where uh, student workload was they were getting feedback through their internal processes that student workload was too high in certain <laughs> modules. But what happened was that each professor responsible for the module immediately responded to the feedback and changed the workload. So that after about 18 months, nobody on the program knew quite what was happening in relation to student workload anymore because it had been reduced in some modules, not in others. Students were choosing the modules that had a lower workload than the other modules, and this was creating an imbalance in the program. So the only thing I would say is that, you know, it, it's something, it seems to me that it's, it's something that requires thought and work. It's not something that can just be changed overnight, but it's actually something that needs to be looked at across 
across an entire program or across an entire institution. Um, it, it's not something that we can get some feedback on a module and then just change it and, and carry on. It's, it's something that has impacts across other aspects of student workload as well. Is that enough, Ibu? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, second question from Ibu Dara from SIL SD. Please, Ibu. Thank you, Ibu Dewi, for the opportunity. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm from um, Head of Quality Assurance and School of uh, Environmental and also School of Strategic and Global Studies. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's very interesting. But um, I, I, I have actually I have uh, two questions. Uh, first, that when uh, Viona say that, that make it simple, but the answer is not simple. <laughs> I just think that uh, more more the simple uh, the question and more the complicated to answer. <laughs> it's a kind of a qualitative method. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. For the first uh, and the fourth questions, I think uh, we just uh, try to explain what we do, uh, what kind of activity, and then I'll explain to uh, everybody about our activity, and then also the reason why we do that, uh, answer for uh, questions. But uh, I think the difficulty uh, comes to the five and the fifth. How do you know it works? It, it depends on, uh, on us, actually. Uh, do we know uh, it works or not? Sometimes we don't realize. Yeah, it, it, is it a word or not? Uh, and then the the, the uh, sixth question: um, uh, We have to identify uh, the problems, and then uh, we decide what kind of uh, um, action that we need uh, to to uh, make uh, it uh, solved. Um, I think. Uh, uh, I need Viona uh, to to more explain about the the fifth and the sixth, how to to, to identify that uh, problems. And then uh, actually, I have a uh, second questions, uh, maybe similar to Miss Tia uh, before. Uh, that it's hard to measure our our product, yes, our outcomes, our students, um, because I'm from the postgraduate. Uh, we don't have uh, bachelor students, and also they they have a, a background a very different. Uh, we kind of ha have a multidiscipline uh, for the perspective, so it's our cha uh, challenge uh, to uh, make our students um, have the same. Uh, I don't know. We we call it uh, culture, but not really culture. Uh, it, it depends on uh, also the break background, and then uh, how we we measure or how we can climb climb them as uh, our product because they're not from uh, just our institution. Also, they uh, maybe they get uh, also the the knowledge or the values from their parents also because uh, yeah we have uh, some discussion with with my my colleagues in 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 uh, Kyoto University that when we uh, send our labor to the to, to the Japan and then uh, some problems that uh, Japan government to have to uh, to pay so much uh, to bring them and then uh, the problem is uh, uh, they cannot uh, say that they can use them uh, as well because uh, they are already prepared in Indonesia to enter the labor market in Japan. That, that's why uh, uh, they have a price very expensive uh, to, to work there. Uh, so how we measure that uh, they they uh, uh, become our product as uh, we not uh, do uh, uh, some uh, education from the beginning. That's, that's my question. Thank you. Do I go with the first one, Oliver, and then, yeah, okay. Okay, you're, you're absolutely right. The questions are simple, but answering them is not. <laughs> but what you've done 
is you've you've kind of gone right to the heart of what for me is is internal or external quality assurance. And those two final questions, how do you know it works? And what do you do to make it better? Those are actually at the heart of, of what I think quality assurance actually is. Because if we if we just carry on doing our teaching, assessing our students, uh, designing, pro, you know, developing programs, setting them up, and we have no idea whether they're achieving their goals, then I think we're, we're failing in our duty. Uh, and if we have no processes whereby once we find out whether they work or not, or we find out whether there are any problems, if we've got no processes for trying to think about how we can make things better, and that's not just about rectifying problems, that's about taking on board new developments in the outside world. But if we've got no processes for that, then we're also stagnating. We're not, we're not moving forward. So the, the only way I can think of to describe this to you is just to, to think of a to think of some of the examples that I've seen recently in institutions. So for example, if you have a program with learning outcomes and goals and objectives, and maybe Two of the learning, one of the two of the objectives are that the student that the student is introduced to uh, uh, the world of employability in that discipline through an internship or through some part of their studies that allows them to go and gain some practical experience. That's one of the goals. And another goal is that um, one of the learning outcomes is that, is that they will be assessed on. Um, that particular aspect of their study. So these are two very small examples for a program. So the first thing is institutions that I know would probably look at the completion and progression rates for that program. And that will help them to know whether or not their goal is being achieved. Is it working? Do the students actually benefit from this internship or this employability aspect of their, their program? <clears throat> what are the outcomes of it? Are you you know, how's that actually working? You might find out how it's working by student feedback surveys. You might also find out whether or not it's working by talking to the employers who provide the opportunities for the internships. If those employers are coming back and saying, you know, the students arrive and they know nothing, we can't use them because they simply haven't got any knowledge, then you know that there's something that's not quite right with your program and that you might need to relook at either that objective or at the modules that are preceding the internship before the student goes. So those are the kind of mechanisms. The very end of the program, if you've got, if you're looking at your statistics, your data for completion of the degree or for progression into the next year, and you're seeing that all the students do really, really well in that area, then you know that it's probably going quite well. And if the feedback's very good, it's probably going quite well. But if your feedback is not so good, and also you're seeing that students are failing that module, you're also then getting an indication through your completion and progression statistics that there's something that might need to be done. Does that make sense? So, is it, so the questions are very simple. What you then do to address those questions is the bit that's more complicated. What I would say, the, the question around um, how do you know it works? If you translate your internal quality assurance into external, responding to an external accreditation, that question, how do you know it works? That's the evidence, because usually you provide a self-assessment report and some evidence to a panel, to a, a peer review team who come to do the accreditation. What you're providing to them is really the evidence that you know that something works. So if you think about how you respond to an external requirement and the evidence that you provide, that's the sort of evidence that you're looking for in response to that question. Does that help a little bit? It's a very small example, but I, we're, we're, we could talk for, we could talk all day. <laughs> we don't have all day. So. <laughs> Thank you. Oliver. Thank you. Um, um, I'll actually refer to your questions, Fiona, about the, the, the second question. Um, I think ultimately it really starts with them. What, 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 yeah, what, what, what do we need to know? How do, can we improve things? What, so, uh, paraphrasing them a bit, I think we're too preoccupied with those notions of measurement and responsibility. So, I'm not arguing we can objectively measure all our outcomes. I don't even think we need to. The 
point I wanted to make is if we really want to improve some of the things we do, or if we did, then we need to understand employability, then we need to understand the job market, then we need to understand that that's what is it, and then we need to understand what people do afterwards. I'm not saying, yeah, uh, Fiona knows that there has been this, this OECD approach or uh, a halo about objectively measuring learning outcomes in higher education. I'm not a big fan of that. I, I, I'm completely against this kind of standardized approach. But everything that helps us to understand better what happens afterwards, how we can learn from that, that's part of IQA. And part of my argument was we, we invest slash waste too much time into repetitions of the same cycles of data gathering without any added value. Why not be creative and go more in the direction of output and outcome? And because Fiona was so kind sharing those small examples and anecdotes, one of them that stuck with me, it's luckily not from our own institution, but maybe it could have happened as well, that the head of my teaching and learning services, she has a degree from another US university and she has a language degree in Roman, Roman languages. Yeah, so Italian, French, and I think she's also a biology teacher uh, by training. And she was, done when she was still a PhD student, so a member of the academic team there of the Institute of Romanistic, uh, of Roman languages, they had a sit down because the university also wanted them to explore the issue of what their graduates were doing. And she said it was the most disturbing afternoon she ever experienced. There were four professors and a couple of assistant professors and two junior teaching assistants like herself sitting down. Their master's degree programs were still fairly new. That was when the Bologna system had changed in Austria. So they had about four graduates on the master's level already, yeah, with not big programs and only a few grants. They were sitting down. And those 10 academics, no one knew what had become out of the only four graduates. So they were sitting together and brainstorming and thinking about what could have happened to them. Does anyone know? Has anyone been in contact? No, we never. And that stuck with me. I mean, of course, it doesn't make sense to have a survey for those people, for people, but how can that happen? You have only four graduates and you never know what happened to them. Well, how can you discuss the quality of education with that kind of, uh, of setup? So sharing with Annika, I think everything we can do to avoid that kind of situation is good. It's not meaning we need a standardized questionnaire that shows what we contributed in terms of education to their own world mindset. That's for researchers to go into deep as their psychologists and educational researchers. We need to be more pragmatic, but we need to do something. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Budara. Thank you. Uh, any other question from the floor? Okay, um, maybe if you don't have any, we don't have any other question, uh, we will have our closing remarks. Uh, I, I, I give my, uh, uh, my, okay, my time to the MC now. Give it back to MC. Thank you very much, uh, Fiona and Oliver. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Fiona, Dr. Oliver, and Dr. Shari for the comprehensive discussion. But before we move to the next session, please kindly remind in place for Dr. Fiona, Dr. Oliver, and Dr. Shari because we will have a photo session. Okay. Uh, the organizing committee will help to Take the photo and I'll help to count the session. Please kindly give your best smile, Dr. Fiona, Dr. Oliver, and Dr. Shari. Mungkin yang lain bisa ikut sekalian. Everybody can open okay. your video. All right. And we'll have a photo, everybody photo session at the same time.
All right. Uh, once again, please, everybody, uh, you may open your camera because we will have a photo session. All right. Okay, once more. Okay. Okay. I'll count the photo session. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. Okay. Maybe once more with the participation or the guests. Okay. I'll have to count again. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much once again, Dr. Fiona, Dr. Oliver, and Dr. Shari for the comprehensive discussion. We would also like to express our gratitude to the distinguished guests who already participated in the question and answer session. Uh, for Dr. Fiona, Dr. Oliver, and Dr. Shari, may you always be healthy wherever you are. And also yeah. for the distinguished guests, we hope you can get a lot of benefit from the discussion. Moving right along, before we end this event, I would like to invite closing remarks. Yeah, uh, I would like to invite Professor Sri Hartati Dewi Reksodiputro Suradijono to to give the closing remark. To Professor Sri Hartati, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just uh, a bit of uh, correction. The closing remark will be given by the vice vice rector, but I'm just going to say thank you. My heart, uh, very, uh, my how do you call? It? I feel very happy and very fortunate to be able to hear your ex your uh, experience, Dr. Fiona and Dr. Oliver. Uh, although I'm only the first two emails that I've sent you, but through that very first email, I got a very positive response and it was uh, able to make us here and brought us all here to meet together. This is our first time from the BPMR uh, or the IQA University of Indonesia to be, uh, to sit together and think about uh, how to be uh, how should we think uh, or how should we make our IQA much better to uh, really lead to the uh, increase, increasing our, our employability, uh, how we call our employability, not rank, but the percentage of our graduates to be employed, employed according to whatever they would like to be much better than, our, than us right now, hopefully. So then thank you. I'm sure you will not be, uh, you will be okay if I contact you further with maybe further questions and things like that. And to all my uh, colleagues here, uh, even the dean, the vice dean, and the director, this morning we have also the, uh, the uh, director, the director general from the uh, uh, teaching and learning from the higher education institution. So we have a lot of uh, knowledge now and we have a lot of skills. Hopefully, after we go back to our home offices, we can uh, at least uh, apply some of it uh, to whatever uh, the task that we are already being given by the university, that is to, to guide the quality assurance from each of our, uh, in each of our study groups. So I'm giving back my uh, position here to the, uh, the master ceremony, yeah, to, for us to hear the closing remarks from the Professor Harris, our Vice Director. Uh, I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Fiona and Oliver. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Hartati, for your speech. All right. Um, to end this event, Moving right along, we would like to invite the Vice Rector for Academics and Student Affairs of Universitas Indonesia to deliver the closing remark. To Professor Abdul Haris, the time is yours. 
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Her Excellency Dr. Fiona Rozier and Dr. Oliver Vettori, speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My peace be upon you and God's mercies for all of us. First of all, on behalf of Universitas Indonesia, I would like to express my warm and sincere thank to you all, distinguished university leader, speaker, and attendants. I'm deeply honored and privileged to have your time in this meeting. We are very pleased to have finally reached the closing session of the webinar with the title Building of State of the Art internal quality assurance to foster and integrate graduate employability. Despite your busy schedule, I appreciate all the participants who have joined the full day seminar. I believe that the seminar has enhanced our awareness of the relationship between quality assurance and graduate employability in higher education. Ladies and gentlemen, with the change in the labor markets, higher education institutions are challenged to continuously increase the quality of education to help our graduate adapt to labor demand. We have learned from our distinguished speaker about the importance of the quality assurance and employability for higher education institutions. The discussion in this, in this seminar not only give us knowledge of the current trend and international practice of quality assurance in higher education institutions, but also help us in reflex on what we have achieved and what to improve. I believe that we gain excellent knowledge and insight from today's sessions. While the discussion and elaboration on this issue, more quality assurance unit in Indonesia are in place, which we will follow up on shortly. We sincerely express our gratitude to the speaker, Indonesian speaker in the morning and the international speaker in the afternoons. We also thank the organizing committee, especially the Academic Quality Assurance Agency of Universitas Indonesia, who has made this webinar possible. Finally, the webinar on building state-of-the-art internal quality assurance to foster and integrate graduate employability is officially concluded. Thank you very much and have a pleasant afternoon. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor Abdul Haris, for the enlightening speech. Distinguished guests, on behalf of Universitas Indonesia and Academic Quality Assurance Board of Universitas Indonesia, or BPMAUI, I would like to convey my deepest gratitude for your participation in this event. We hope this event enhances our awareness on the relationship between quality assurance and graduate employability of higher education. We wish you all a pleasant day and may we always be healthy during these trying times. My name is Isha and it has been an honor for you to be your master of ceremony for today and it has been our pleasure to host this event. Thank you very much and see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.
bangsa Gelora semangat Nusantara Di Universitas Indonesia